Stop right there. Yeah, you. If you like all things entertainment, current events, or Hollywood, then look no further. Creator to Creators, hosted by director Mio Shabin of Horror Noir, interviews filmmakers and creatives from around the world. Join in on the fun, guest celebrities, and informative information to have as a creator. Hit subscribe and stay connected to Creator to Creators. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Creators to Creators today. Today we have a special guest. Auntie Barrett. Hey, welcome to the show. So glad you could do this. Thank you. Thank you. It's it's been a pleasure. I really, you know, me and you and I stay in contact, you know, here and there, but you know, we just we just trying to, you know, make it make it through this, you know, this season, I should say. Oh yeah. This interesting time right, <laughs> 2020 <right>. has been <laughs> definitely definitely historic <laughs> I, I agree i definitely agree. so so tell me i know a lot about you but the listeners uh tell me from the beginning growing up and and how was that how was your childhood oh wow my childhood was kind of it was it was a childhood it was a, a city life childhood fast various uh, exposed to a lot at an early age. Um, also, it was it was breaking, but it was challenging. It was great. It was horrible. You know, so many different experiences and emotions from the childhood. But nevertheless, to say that I'm here, 49. You know, I prevailed. God had an angel looking over me as I was going through the childhood. You know, so. Um, I'm actually in the making of doing some things of, with, you know, with my pain to bring me some release and help. So, you know, that'll be coming soon. But in the meantime, you know, my childhood and growing up in New York City and South Jamaica, Queens, it was kind of, it was kind of rough. Uh, but you become a product of your environment because that's all you know. Right. You know, so you don't know anything else until I started getting, when I got older and I started traveling and then when I got involved in boxing at a later age, I was a young adult. I started traveling the world. I started seeing so many things. And I was like, wow, it's more than just New York. That's when I think I started opening up. And as a, as a kid, you, you're a dreamer. Like me, I was a dreamer. I'll be in La La Land with my little, you know, with my little thoughts and things like that. And um, for the most part, when I, when I opened up and I got older and I started seeing all these things, I said, wow. Right. You know, it's more experiences, it's more being more accountable, it's being having more fun, not taking life so serious. Right. What were some of your interests growing up? I mean I I, I my first interest that I, I love I love animals. I love pets. So I had so many dogs that I grew up with. Then um my second one that I like to write poetry. So when I was oh. young, yeah, when I was like uh eight, nine years old, I used to write little poems. And oh. as I got older, I started writing more deep poems. And then even um, as of recently, um, when, when my wife, when I met her, I started writing a lot of poems. And she was like, you know what? You're so good at this. You need to open up your own home art. Like, oh, wow. That's online. Um, so I was like, all right, cool. But we never, you know, it's just like it takes a lot of time to be for a masterpiece. You know, you can't, you can't just write any old thing. A lot of those things come come to some naturally for me. You know, I'm gifted. God gifted me with a couple of things. One of the things he gifted me was with uh, expression, communication, and also learning how to manage people. So those little things have taken me far. That's great. That's wonderful. Wow, poetry. I would have never thought that. <laughs> right, right. That's, really, <laughs> that's really cool. So how did you find your way into, you know, boxing? Boxing, oh, okay, so that goes, that reflects back to my childhood. You know, I was in a very, um, um, the, the year I came up in the 80s was very, you know, drug-related areas as far as, you know, um, crack and cocaine and all of that. Mm-hmm. And, um, and the, also the, the needles, what do you call it? The, the um, dope things, you know, um, heroin. Yeah. So I did a lot of fighting because I was a big kid, but I was the youngest kid out of all of my friends. So I had to fight everybody back. Oh, wow. So in doing so, I got really good at fighting. And, you know, then um, one thing led to another. And then at an early age, I started hustling. Okay. I didn't know what I was doing. Mm-hmm. You, know, I was, you know, I was making sneaker money, you know, $100 to $1,000 a week. 
and, and getting high school was a lot of money back then. Mm -hmm. um, but I was always skilled with my hands. So, you know, fast forward, like when I was 21 years old, I was involved in this, this movement called um, Collision, mm -hmm. which is a construction company. And we go and we, uh, we get minorities jobs, right? That's awesome. And, um, I, I, I got over five to six hundred jobs in my neighborhood for people, you know, all different type of work, you know, teachers, people, you know, because this is twenty five, thirty dollars an hour in ninety one, ninety two, right? And with no experience, all you do is kind of know how to wave a flag or sell. I uh, I met this guy named Herbie Bill, and he introduced me to this friend named Abraham Davis. They call him Pops. Pops now. He passed away in two thousand seventeen. He was twenty two years old. Wow. He was born in 1914. He kind of took me on his wing and he kind of like, you know, you know, showed me ropes of boxing. And uh, then he took me to Star City and I met great Jimmy O'Farrell. And you know, life just changed for me. You know? I started winning all these tournaments and winning. And I was fighting, I was a grown man fighting kids, 16, 17 years old. Wow. But these kids were, you know, the whole life. Boxing. I was fighting kids who had 60, 70 fights versus my seven, eight. Wow. I was winning. I won all these national tournaments and uh, I uh, got a whole bunch of money and sponsorship. And next thing you know, um, I, got, uh, I won the Golden Clubs a couple of times, um, US Championship, uh, PAL Championship, on all these championships. And I uh, had made the offers to turn pro. I didn't go to big, big offers, but I did go with an offer that I thought was good for me. Right. And, and, and two years of being with my, my, my manager, Joe DeGuardi, at the time, I wound up signing a first 750 bill. And life just kind of just changed. I'm sure that was an adjustment that was like, whoa, it's so fast, right? Like you said, you're traveling, you're fighting. How, how often were you training? I'm curious. Like, I don't really, I mean, I know a little bit about boxing <laughs> because I worked for a boxer at one point in my right. videography career, but that's about it. So how, how often I trained? So as an amateur, I didn't know anything about boxing. I just knew street fighting. Ah, I see. Much different, right? So I, I was, I was, um, Al Davis had a gym called The Dungeon in his basement with, oh, wow. you know, so it was like a really dark place no light and no life. Oh, Only just punching bags and pulleys and it just me, him, and, and just that equipment. And uh, we did that for six months and then we went to Star City. When we went to Star City, that was a whole like, full-fledged gym. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to, you know, I was comfortable as a as an amateur because I was making around $15,000 a week, a month mm -hmm. with this, this company, right? So I was able to focus just on boxing. Right. So I dedicated all my time to boxing. I first one in the gym, and I was the last one out the gym. Mm -hmm. nice. Gym was open from five to eight. So basically, I honed my craft. I was a puppet bag for uh, some up and coming guys at the beginning. In the beginning, and probably six months to a year later, they couldn't even touch me. Wow! It's like what you get in, what you put in is what you get out of it. Right. 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 The result. So I mean, it, was, it varies, but. I mean, I choose to train harder because of my drive. Like, I've always had this drive since I was a kid. I played high school football, I played basketball. I was an athlete all along, and I was a street kid. So I had that, I had both, I had both um, um, you know, working for me, being from the street. Because some things, you can't teach a boxer. Right, you can't right. teach a boxer how to take a punch. Right. You can teach him how to dodge a punch, but when you take it, it's a different reaction. Yeah. Some guys might be do all that good in the gym. As soon as they get punched, they're like, I don't want to do this no more. <laughs> and I heard yeah, guys yeah. tell me those stories. So fortunately, I was a, a tough kid. So it kind of worked in my favor. Yeah, that's good. I'm, I'm glad it worked out. Yeah, because I mean, I, I can only imagine, like you said, you, you taking your punches completely different. Because I, I, when, I, when I see it, I'm like, how? <laughs> that's all the time. <laughs> I, know, I, know. I said to myself, I, I took a couple of friends to the fights and I was like, man, I can't believe I did this all this sport. Wow. wow. You know, looking at it from the outside and seeing these guys on ringside just take these punches, I'm like, wow, oh, I did that. Yeah. I mean, it just looks so brutal, you know? But when you're young, you're Superman. Right. And you get older, you, reach, you, you, you meet kryptonite, you know? <laughs> and you like, you know, fall back. 
right, right. Who were some of your um like inspirations in the boxing world? And I'm sure you got to meet a lot of the people that you I mean, yeah. admire in the boxing right. world. But who were some of those? Well, I didn't meet the only person I would look. I, would, I thought I was going to meet him. I'm not late. I fought, I fought, I fought um, Tim Witherspoon, former heavyweight champion, on the undercard of Jackie Frazier and Layla Ali. Oh, nice. nice. Joe Frazier's daughter and Jackie and um, Layla Ali, Muhammad Ali's daughter, fought in upstate New York at the um, at the Turning Stone. Ali didn't come that day. So, uh. I didn't, I didn't, so that was, you know, that was like, yeah, that was a bummer. But, you know, it was so many great, you know, it was everybody from the Hall of Fame international thing with there so oh, very I got cool. to meet a lot of fighters and I I wasn't in I wasn't a big boxing fan I just loved Mike Tyson nice. I, loved I loved Sugar Ray Leonard I loved Darth I loved Hoya but I wasn't a big boxing fan growing up interesting I just you know I was in the streets yeah so, but um but meeting all those guys and having asset I bet I bet that was I mean obviously it's a very competitive sport but I mean, to, to always to go out there and like, I guess you said you have to have that winner mentality and you have to, it has to be something that you want to do because there's so many new people coming through all the time. Like I, when I look at boxing, I'm like, I mean, like, it's like film, it's very competitive. It's even like, how do you get in, like, how did you, to stay, to keep a long lasting career? I'm sure that had to be something right. that you had to make up. All right, I'm going to do this. Did you have a plan, like your exit plan after doing this? No, I was just kind of like doing it. Okay, I was, just, I was winging it. You know, to be honest with you, I mean, it was like it was like um, you know, even though in some point in my life when I was younger, mm-hmm. go back to myself, like I'm blessed, like I'm favored, like I knew that I was going to be something, and I don't feel like boxing is my last calling. I don't feel like it's my aha moment. I, mean, I just feel like it was a, it's a, it's a, um, a catapult to the where I'm going, but I always felt like like I'm supposed to be I'm supposed to be around these people I'm supposed to be around them. I'm supposed to be making money I am supposed to be doing these things I always felt like that it wasn't a sense of cockiness but more so just like more of a spirit of like you know God didn't put me on the earth just to just to be just average right, right? and to a certain degree it's like levels in life right. Okay, so when I was a kid, when I was a kid, it was above average and everything I did, even even the, the bad things. Uh, you know, I did I did the bad things good. You know, of so the fight, and I did that good. It look what it took me to the boxing. Yeah. Then I right. So I always just felt like that. so I didn't feel like it was um I didn't I didn't feel like it was that to the point of um how can I say I'm stuck on the world with the the emotion that I have that. But I felt like I was supposed to be there. Like this is this is a part of my journey. Right, right. Uh, my wife is me later on. Like trust the process. Yeah. Trust the process. You know, when you're younger, you don't know what's going on. And like I said, I was winging it, and I was just good. When you're good at something, it, you can do two things. You can just be average with it, good with it, or you can work on it and harness your skills and be better. Right. right. So I was like torn in between like a lot of my shortcomings in the fight game was really me fighting myself you know bad habits things that I wasn't taught as a young man mm. with women with you know responsibility with accountability with um you know just you know having discipline more discipline a lot of big fights that I lost was because of my own marriage because mm. I wasn't focused you know I was chasing women you know not having a discipline they focus on the task at hand. Right, right. And that kind of hurt me moving down the line because, you know, I'll get to a point, then I'll just always fold. Like, when I say not in a fight, but fold within my own self. Like, right. you know, because I, I hold myself accountable and I fall short and I'm like, damn, I know I could have did much better. Gotcha. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I've, I've learned a lot about accountability and I'm still learning every day. Definitely. That's awesome. No, that's great. I mean, that's really good. What, after boxing, after, you know, this, you know, after boxing, what did you, did you want, what did you want? Like, were you working on something where you're like, okay, I want to try this. I want to do this. Or what did you get? What did you start doing after? After boxing, after boxing, it was, it was hard for any athlete that Mm. has been doing something that's comfortable. 
easy, make a lot of money, and to do anything. And the last four, the last fight I had, I think 2014, I fought Los Ortiz, and I was like, you know, I was like, I'm not doing this. I was like, you know, I got, I got stopped. I, I think it was a premature stop, but I get it. And I was like, you know, gotta keep it moving. Right. So what was I thinking? I was like, okay, um, you know, it took a lot of heart to leave because I still think offers, good offers. Right. I didn't want to be a somebody's punching bag and then being a, a journeyman. So I was like, you know, let me bow out. I did a lot in boxing. Let me just go gracefully right. on my right. own merit. And I should have left three years prior to that. When I fought David Two in 2011, when I won the WBO, nice. I should have been like, that was it. But, you know, as athletes, you still like, you feel like, man, you're chasing the bread, you're chasing the fame, you're chasing mm-hmm. everything, right? So that hurt me. But in um, no respect, um, when I retired, damn, I had so many ideas. I'm a thinker. And so I thought to jump in me. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the good and bad in me, and my mom and dad in me. I split the personality to check the off in the feet to make right, sure okay. it's he and I am me. That's the good man. <laughs> yeah, so, so basically, I just like um, um. So basically, I just was like, oh, what am I do? And so I, I went to our jobs, trying to figure out what's next. And um, I I met somebody uh, guy, and we started fights just on some casual like. I was training training him. Take him to the fights. He loved it. He was like, yo, you should do it. I said, do what? He said, you should take people to the fights. Have like the concierge service. I was like, oh, good idea. So he helped me kind of develop the plan. And I came up with a website. I came up with a price point. I came up with this and I came up with that. And then, you know, I just started experimenting. You know, what what you know, what to do, what to in, what to bring in, to take out. You know how you know, and then I called my 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 um, my boxing brother. My, he's like a little brother to me, Zab Judah. I was like, "Yo, I got a plan. Let's do this." And he was like, All right. "That's awesome." We started Brad VIP, the sports concierge service. That's awesome. Congratulations on that. That's cool. That's awesome. I'm I'm curious too. You know, now that <clears throat> every, you know we're in a weird time right now with the whole COVID situation and this whole pandemic that has happen and and i mean there's so many other things that just ha- happen as well the black lives matter movement i mean all these things how did you stay balanced what kept you balanced during this time hmm. no let me see what kept me balanced this time well i just think i'm an even kill person mm. right? so you know um i i think that less is more for me so me you know I had some. I had some things I was dealing with emotionally. You know, I'm an emotional being, so <laughs> right. So I had some things I was dealing with emotionally, but for the most part, I was like, you know, it's just a season. Right. I, I still embrace this as a, as a season, but I do understand. And every season, you know, it comes. It comes um trial, trial and error. Just you know, just went with the with the flow. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and when it came to the safety and the you know, wearing a mask and wearing gloves and being washing hands and you know, then you have family, then you have kids, you know, you you're thinking about all of those things. But I don't think that I do I just think like I this is my new our new normal. Our new normal is this. We just gotta learn how to adjust to it this right. season. I don't know if things will ever be like they used to be as far as I think so, you know, we just gonna have to figure it out. But you know, just like the Israelites, they was in um they was in, in the wilderness for 40 years. Yeah. They went to their promised land. Oh, God, know. I hope it's not 40 years. <laughs> but, you know, listen, I just think, you know, it's just like, you know, a lot of rebellious, a lot of people, you know, right. idols, and, you know, that's the same thing that's going on now. Yeah. And hopefully we don't know. You know, we don't know, we, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, let alone next year. Yeah. We just We just be grateful. Yeah. Um, with that being said, just... Just embrace it. You just have you have to make make adjustments. That's why, like guys like Floyd Mayweather, that's why he's the best at the door. You know why? Whenever Floyd got hurt, or whenever he was in a good fight, or mm-hmm. thought it was gonna be a good fight, he made those adjustments. I see. And he made them on the drop of a dime, and it was about his instincts. Training so hard, 
you know, me being friends with Floyd and Zab and all of us, Tava and Nate Jones and Lamian Brewster, that was all the 96 team Olympics. I didn't make it to Olympics, but I made it to the trial. But we all, we all fought together in tournaments. Nice. And so, you know, we always look, Floyd show love to all of us, right? Right. And me and Zab was out there for his big fight with Kostu that he lost. And Floyd, we used to, we used to, he used to um, play basketball. We all played basketball to like four in the morning, three, four, four court games, talking junk, mad energy, mm-hmm. mad energy all over. And Floyd, every night after every game, he would get on the treadmill and run four miles. Wow. So that, and I'm like, that's amazing. Like, and you don't think of like, when you look at it, like, I didn't know back then, you know, this is 2000. Right. Back then, I see him get on treadmill. I'm like, you know, he just went through his workout, right? But as you fast forward and think now where we are and where he is, mm-hmm. he got out the game, undefeated, all, everybody hitting agendas. He never, he never folded, right? Right. But then he got all his marbles. He's still sharp as a razor, and he got all his money. Right. You got to tip, tip your hat off to that man. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Right. And and being and being an African American man in the business, I'm sure that's a and another... that's another thing. But yeah. he got he had great people around him. You know. So I mean, it was uh, somebody really prayed hard for his life. His grandmother, his great grandmother, his mother. But somebody had an anointing over his life because being in any sport, you hear it. You know, thirty for thirty. Mm. For all these guys, hundreds of millions of dollars. You no, know, yeah. I have. I went. You know what I'm saying? Just that's life. Mm-hmm. You know, because you want to take care of everyone. Right. You know, family, friends, and leeches. You want to, you know, you can't please everybody, but we sure. think that, you know, money is going to save the save people. It's not. It's gonna it's gonna bring out the true the true being in it. That's so and true. So, but you don't you're not measuring both sticks when you are in the midst of everything. Right. When you're in the midst of all of that chaos and the negotiating and, and the moving and yo come on let's go you take five guys i can take 10 mm. everybody want it you know right i took i took 12 14 people to london my bill was like 10 12 000, wow. you know but right? it was a lot of money and then when i got there i spent another probably five thousand you know but you're not thinking right it's like i just want you know i want to get them i want to do this for them because they right. never had it or you know the experience you know and we want to be people's savior Mm. And so I commend Floyd for making the adjustments. So the question was, you have to make adjustments. You got to right. make adjustments with this COVID. We got to make adjustments with our lifestyle, with our, with our actions, you know, and our process of where we move forward. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. Definitely make adjustments. Yeah. Like you said about even in the boxing uh, uh, being, you know, because it's very competitive, ca- competitive in the film industry um, when it comes to being a woman of color and uh, doing, you know, film. I wonder, it, was it like that for, for, is it like that for African-American men in the boxing uh, arena? Is, 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 your, is it different in pay or whatever? Because I know it's definitely different in pay for women and men in film. I mean, there's a huge gap. Um, when it comes to minorities and others, is it a huge difference? Yes and no. I see. First, um, no, because um, no, because black fighters come a dime a dozen. Right. Black athletes come a dime a dozen. But when you got one, like a, a white guy or Italian guy, or Irish guy, or an Asian guy, or whatever, you know, uh, they 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 shot like probably one, right? Meaning that all the energy is on them because they don't really shine in the sport gotcha. like that. So they get higher pay, more opportunities, better presentation, right? Mm. It's like, you know, even look, think about this, right? When Floyd fought, as much money as he made and where he is now, Floyd was in his prime. Nobody knew who he was and really cared because Roy Jones was in the prime. Right. Roy Jones, remember? He was, right. Nobody cared about Floyd at that time. Everybody, Roy had the out and, and the fans on lockdown. He was such a, a showman shit, right? Mm-hmm. So, but, um, I, 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 but, you know, like even a guy named John Duddy, I don't know if you remember him, but he was a New York guy, Irish kid. 
and by himself. Now, this guy never, I think he fought on, on TV, HBO. He always fought on MSG. Mm-hmm. Fought on HBO one time. John Duddy, an Irish kid from Ireland, sold out Madison Square Garden in a small arena. Mm-hmm. He sold it out every time he fought. Oh, wow. He sold out the guard every time. He sold tickets. And this whole, the name of the boxing game is called No Business. Right. No boxing right. business. You got to sell tickets. Right? You know? And think about, you know, a lot of black athletes don't sell. Mm. Right? They sell a long time. You know? Uh, a lot like Zab. Zab, you know, Zab sold tickets. He did pretty well. Because he had a great follow on the Mike Tyson. Nice. Right? And then plus he was right. Plus he was like, you know, he was super. He was a football. Either, you know, pick up Brooklyn, you know, the biggest borough in the world is Brooklyn, you know. <laughs> but yeah, but um, but you know, it's a business, you gotta sell tickets, you gotta right. put seats in, you gotta put bus in the seats. So, like I said, so John Duddy, the Irish kid, by the way, and this guy made probably more money than the guy who had a career for 15 years and he was in the game probably for six, seven, seven years. But imagine him selling out uh, the arena. Um, yeah, I was a seats in a little in a in a little. Uh, I forgot what they call it. They call it something else now. Um, the whatever theater. Um, but he sold out. Wow. That's, that's 150, 200,000 and we're not talking about advertisement and promotion. Wow. Yeah. Right? So it's all about it's all about <clears throat> um, it's it's all about talent, but in time, of course, favor. You know, look at the day and age that we live in. Um, the answer to your question is, it's different, but it's not different. Gotcha. Like I said, uh, black athletes, dime a dozen, and white athletes and other uh, nationalities don't really show up as much. So when one does show up, it's the royal treatment. Right. Yeah. I get you. I get you. It's kind of like that one guy. I remember, I, I didn't know who he was, but he, the guy that fought, I think it was Mayweather. He was a MMA fighter, I want to say, and then turned boxing. He was, he was a what? I a think he used fighter. to be an MMA fighter or something uh, like that. Um, oh, I've, I, I don't know. It's Conor McGregor. That guy. That's that's the only time I heard of him. I was like, right. oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. But Conor McGregor was an MMA fighter, right? Like to say he fought UFC. But the Irish fighter as well. And, oh, uh, yeah. He made, he made $100 million, right? He made $100 million just being just talking, being at the right place at the right time, having the right weight. You know, because he can fight Floyd, right. and um, you know, he has so much support. You know, and versus like, um, if the uh, if that was a black fighter, they would have to work to get to that space. Oh, Basically, wow. it was delivered to him. You know, because yeah. it could have been so many other fighters from UFC that were better than him. Mm-hmm. His weight division to fight Floyd, but he had the whole gimmick. He's a talker. He's a you know, he's he's cocky. You know, uh, and Dana White is a, is a genius. You know, he's yeah. he's a uh, he's uh mar- he's corner off the market you know, the UFC, okay. you know, and having one president to a whole big sport like that, and being able to have a personal relationship with the fighter, right. he has a lot of influence. Boxing is so broken up because you got twenty different promoters, and everybody's fighting for the fighters, and they treat the fighters like kings until they get them, then they treat them like you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so, but so that's why that's why the UFC is so successful in a short period of time. Even though boxing is really great and you make way more money than the UFC fighters, but we get we don't get as much money on the back end as the fighters. Like our 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 um, our gross our net and gross is way different than right. a UFC fighter when. You know, um, these are small. The UFC has really came a long way in a yeah. short period. For sure, yeah. I I wonder, like, do you think boxing is? Um, I don't know. As ex- do you think people are watching boxing as it like they used to? Because yeah. I don't know. It's different. I haven't really heard anyone coming out as of lately. No, I don't think. I think that every ten years, the boxing has a. It's two things that happen every ten years. Every ten years. Boxing depletes, but also every 10 years, boxing finds a star. Mm. So it's an oxymoron. Right. You get what I'm saying, right? Please, because when, think about this in the 70s, it was Ali, mm. right? 
then 80s it was um 80s it was um cigarette linen mm-hmm. 90s was tyson you always have a song but it, it takes it takes away every every it's like every sport like you know football was a brutal sport now we have so many rules you know people it, it's not the same but when you have investing hundreds of millions of dollars into these athletes you've got to protect the athletes right you can't really protect the boxer but so much because they're in a hand-to-hand combat war right but as far as i just feel like it, it it's depleting with and you know and granted um Boxing is not a U.S. sport. It's a London sport. It originated in London, right? And, yeah. Um, oh, nice. And, nice. Yeah, and then on top of that, we're so occupied as human beings now. We don't have much time for anything. That's not you know, so true. If it, if it ain't on our phone, you know, <laughs> you know, we we used to, you know, we used to have fight parties going out. I don't know me, my age difference than yours. You know, probably ten years, eleven. Right? I'm I'm thirty. Yeah. Right. And, <laughs> All right, so I'm really old. I'm almost no. 20 minutes. Right, right. So my oldest is 27. My oldest. Nice. Right, so, right, so it was back in, and you, you came up underneath, so you've seen gatherings in the family and the group and, and the, the camaraderie, but it's not like that. Everybody's like, you, you, um, you at Thanksgiving like this on your phone. Right. <laughs> <laughs> on your phone, get on Instagram. Post it, put on your storyline, answer your comments. Yeah, girl, I'm here, I'm popping up, popping up. You know, it's not. Right. What about the family? You know what I'm saying? Like, put yeah. the phone down. You know, no phone. <laughs> everybody wants, you know, everybody know what they're doing. That's so true. <laughs> uh, it's funny. That's totally me. Um, <laughs> but I, I'm actually working. <laughs> That's my defense. <laughs> um, what What advice would you give to someone that wants to get into the boxing world? Don't <laughs> go somewhere else. Like I, I honestly, I was like, "Dang!" Like when it was all said and done. Okay, I made money. Yeah. Traveled the world. I've been on over twenty-two international trips. You know, I've met so many people. I've done so many things. I'm grateful for. You know, I am so grateful. But I didn't get a chance to nourish my family. I lost on my first. I've been married three times. My first. Right? We have four daughters together. Mm-hmm. And boxing, I'm not, I can't blame boxing. I got to blame myself. But if you don't have the balance and you don't have the support that you, that respect it, like, you know, because I'm making hundred, two, three hundred thousand a fight. And I go to my mother or my family and say, oh, what should I do with this? They never seen that type of money before. Right. What advice right. are they going to give me? They can't. Right? I go to a, a guy, whether black or white, in a suit and tie as an accountant. And I say, hey, help me with spend, um, put his money up. He steals it. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, you know, and it, it doesn't happen to everybody, but it happens for a lot of us, right? You, you can't trust people. And, and that's a whole nother uh, um, show. You know what I'm saying? But the point of it is that if you're going to go into boxing, just make sure the most important thing is don't do it for the love. Right. Do it for the love. Do it because I like my, my son, my stepson is boxing pretty good right now. But I told him, you know, he's, I can do this, I can do this, and not. If you're not doing it just because for the competition or because you like competing or you like fighting, mm-hmm. then don't do it. Right. Because it doesn't work. Because the money, the money is not going to come to you when you just it's when you see it, it comes to you when you when you're just being authentic. Mm-hmm. And if you're good at something and you're great, and it's gonna the money's gonna come to you. So I always I would tell a, a young kid, do it if you love it, and this is something that you want to make a life of. Right. You know what I'm saying? But to understand if you go that route, it's a lot of commitment and sacrifice that you have to be willing to take. Right? Absolutely. And a lot of things you're gonna to have to learn to put up with. And the most important thing that I can tell any any fighter is don't go off the emotions. Your emotions always keep your intelligence. I never fight emotionally. The times that I fought emotionally, I lost. Mm. 
can't think about this. Are you with your, your husband or your boyfriend and go to a meeting and see the shot? Are you you're gonna do horrible? That's true. <laughs> right? And you think, oh, well, boxes, they gotta be mean, they gotta be angry. No, they gotta be smart. This is science. It's not a it's not a brutal sport to a degree it is, but it's you gotta be smart. You gotta outweigh that's why Ali did so well. Yeah. You know, because it's a science. So you know, I would tell our young fighters, make sure you do your research and talk to some people out of boxing, outside of boxing, and most of all, talk to God and have a conversation and ask God to lead you. And then the most important person that they're closest to, your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, have a conversation with them and they're gonna they're gonna give you a, a transparent answer about who you are because they know you. Right. Because, you know, everything that glitz is not gold. Absolutely. And we get we get tricked. You know, every picture you see on Instagram, you don't know the pain that's behind that picture. That's so you know? True. Or the story behind that that, that story. So you just gotta do your you gotta do your homework and you don't gotta analyze everything, but you just gotta be aware of everything. Absolutely. Right? Love that. Thank yeah. you. Um that's great advice. Uh are you Working on anything? Are you have something coming up that you want to share with us on the show? Uh, I, I I got some amazing things going, but I one thing less is more. Okay. <laughs> less is more, and the less people I know because I have I've had some like and not just me as right. you know. The more people know, the more they can disturb you. That's so true. Right. So, so true. right. So my thing is, and, and people can handle your blessings too. Absolutely. Everything is not meant for everybody. Yes. Um, even your company, I, I'm learning you know, that, you know, I may have a blessing for you, but that person that's in your life, it might not be for them. Mm-hmm. They might have to do, you might have to do some, you know, some staring up and fixing up to get them out of there. Right. You know? So, you know, um, just say that uh, we're working on some really major things and uh, I'm looking forward to this and, you know, maybe, um, in a couple of years, this interview would be mean more more to you and me than it did just they. Ah, you know, right? Thank you. You get what I'm saying, but uh, no, but everything is good. You know, I, I, I'm very grateful. You know, my wife and my daughter. We prayed this morning, and awesome. you know, everything is a day of, of of resolution, resolving. You know, because we as a people, we have so many demons that we're fighting, mm-hmm. and. We so we sometimes we lose focus, and I'm learning you're only as good as your support system. And my wife and I, we try to give Gabrielle what we didn't have, you know, and show her how she should be treated, show her how what she should do, and show her how hopefully she can be when she grows up and have a family. Absolutely, he's a young lady. You know, it's about it's about family. Family's not everything. It's the only thing. And um, especially when you have your, you know, and all family ain't good, but you know True. what I'm saying? Right? Because you see a family, you're worse because only, those are only people can really, like, only people can get on your, under your skin. Like, a person on the street can't get, you know, I, I see him, like, I blow the horn at him, you know, he give me the finger, curse me out, call me that type of name. And I'm like, go ahead, just go about your business. <laughs> I'm not going to chase him down. Like, I don't, he's not a part of my life. He's not right. a part of my story. But, you know, he might be a, a small period story by information <laughs> moment, right? Yeah. But, you know, so we just got to focus and concentrate on our story and let it be written the way it should be written, right? That's so true. And, and you know, and, um, and all the family, the family, the base. Family is the base. It's the foundation of all the best people. Absolutely. And you and I, you know, being of the same color and being of the same experiences in life, Pretty sure we have a note and post together, and we're gonna we're gonna be using us on a lot of different things, and so we gotta take that and let it work for us, and not work against it. Absolutely, we're not victim. We're victim. We're victim. Absolutely. Thank you so much. What a great conversation. Thank okay. you so much for coming on. This was a pleasure to talk to you, and um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right, guys. Well, that's another episode. Until next time, remember to live, love, laugh.